Hello everyone, this is Ben Coyle uh, coming to you from an area in the country that has a fair amount of pollen and two really active chipmunks outside my window, about 15 miles north of Boston, Massachusetts. And this is Bob Henderson uh, coming to you from Raleigh, North Carolina. So we've, uh, our weather has been up and down, uh, a little bit of rain, a little sunshine, uh, high temps, lower temps. Uh, so we're, uh, we're enjoying the weather change. And Colleen McLaughlin, I'm in Bergen County, New Jersey. It's a beautiful day and I can't wait to get outside. Excellent, so today we're gonna to be talking to you about area and pathway lighting, focusing on RAB products that we have. You can see here in this photo, we have a picture of this office building with some high pressure sodium lamps. So when we talk about area lighting, uh, we want to, to you guys to have a couple of different takeaways. The first takeaway is right here. We want you to learn the lighting metrics that affect our area and pathway lighting decisions. Uh, takeaway number two is we want you to understand how to uh, how a lighting ordinance can impact your RAB fixture selections and pole placements. And the last takeaway is design with the correct lighting from RAB that provides good visibility is the key to success. So we do have a variety of marketing brochures. We've covered that in a couple of different webinars that we've done uh, since uh, this pandemic started. We actually have eight different vertical marketing brochures and area lighting has a little piece in each one of those. Those eight marketing brochures can be found on drive.rabweb.com. So here we have a screenshot of that. And then we can also find those on rablighting.com underneath the news section. And underneath that news section, if you click on the little thing that says lighting, can, lighting and control solutions, you will be directed to those eight uh, vertical marketing brochures that we have. So when we talk about area and pathways, there are a couple of goals that we need to uh, meet when we use lighting in those uh, spaces. Uh, the first one that we have there is safety. The second one is security. You've heard me, if you've been to one of the webinars that we've done so far, you've heard me talk about safety. That is, uh, is there a crack in the road? Everybody's had the problem where they've been walking along, they didn't see a step. You take a step off and you get that jarring sensation up your spine uh, when you hit the ground because you weren't expecting that uh, step. So safety has to do with, can you safely navigate uh, barriers, uh, cracks, uh, trips and falls or obstructions inside of the space. The second piece of the puzzle that I really haven't focused much on is the security aspect of things. Now security is the, be the ability to uh, be able to see somebody in the space. Can you identify a person, what they were wearing, what they look like? Uh, one of the things that we need to make sure that when we talk about area and pathway lighting, that uh, lighting doesn't necessarily make a place more secure. The way that you make a place secure is to use fences, to use walls, to use locks. Uh, uh, lighting doesn't do that. Lighting doesn't necessarily prevent a person from entering a space, but it will deter them from entering the space and doing something nefarious. Another goal of lighting, and we'll spend a fair amount of time on this. Bob will spend a fair amount of time talking about the quantity and quality of light. Those two go hand in hand, and it's not like one trumps the other. Uh, they both need to work in conjunction to be able to uh, meet the demands of a pathway and an area situation. Uh, the next one here we have is navigation. You know, when you're trying to get from point A to point B, uh, you need to be able to get uh, to that location. The last one that we have, uh, which I'll be talking a little bit more about when we talk, uh, uh, when I address our bollards, is the ambiance. So what do you want the space to look like? We can have uh, a space look uh, nice, even illuminated, or we, we might want to create a little bit of shadow to create some drama. And we'll talk about that as we go through this presentation. So what are the topics? The topics that we're going to be covering today happen to deal with both the theory of lighting, uh, what we need to do from a lighting standpoint, and also what RAB has to offer. So Bob, here in just a few moments, is going to be talking about a couple of key characteristics when we think about area and pathway lighting. Uh, the first one here is distribution of light. I can't say enough about the distribution of light. If you don't have the light in the right spot, uh, the situation outside will not be uh, good for uh, the people that are navigating through that space. So the distribution of light, a lot of the things we talk about today can be pulled directly back to that distribution of light. 
Other things Bob's going to talk about, he's going to talk about uniformity. He's going to talk about IES luminaire classifications. He's going to spend a fair amount of time talking about lighting ordinances and how light level and light pollution, light trespass, glare, and this thing called the bug rating, how those all fit in with a lighting ordinance and may affect the decisions that you make when you actually won't go to select a specific product. The last topic that Bob is going to talk about before he kicks it back over to me uh, to talk about the product is poll locations. He'll talk about his experience that he's had with placing the polls in the correct location. So we have these goals. We have these things we need to understand. Now it's Bob's job to help you understand some of the concepts of lighting that you need to know when you do a proper area and pathway design. Okay, thank you, Ben. So uh, let's talk a little bit first, as Ben mentioned, about the distribution of light. So when we uh, talk about distribution uh, of light, uh, we're going to talk first about uniformity and then the IES distribution classifications. So first of all, uh, let's focus in on uniformity. So what you see here is uh, a, a value. Uh, this is a, a, a point by point uh, layout. And you'll see at each, each one of these points there's a value. There's a foot candle value. So you'll see the minimum is 1.6 and the maximum is 9.8. So uniformity has to do with comparing these two. So if you take and calculate the max to min uniformity ratio, you say, well, I don't know how to do that. Actually, it's pretty simple. So you just uh, compare the, the one to the other. So if you take the maximum of 9.8 and divide that by 1.6, max and min in the area, then you get a uniformity ratio, max to min uniformity ratio of six to one. You say, okay, that's great. So what does that mean? So let's take a look at this parking lot here. So this is one with poor uniformity. So as we observe this, you'll see there's a little bit of a dark spot in the center, and then to each side, there's more, uh, more lighting. So this same max to min ratio, this is about a 25 to one max to min ratio. Uh, now, let's compare that to much improved uniformity. So the higher the ratio, the worse the uniformity. Okay, let's say that one more time. The higher the ratio, the worse the uniformity, going from light spots to dark spots. <clears throat> now, if we take a look at this uniformity, this is a three to one, very smooth, and the way you get this better uniformity is what I call low glare vertical light. So overlapping of light, the vertical light in a low glare fashion coming in and lighting and, and making it very smooth. When the poles are spaced very far, far apart and the distribution is not correct, then you get uh, a higher ratio, which is poor uniformity. So also, as, as you get into an area with good uniformity, people feel safer with good uniformity. And so this feeling, you, when you enter an area, you want to feel safe and secure, as Ben talked about. So uh, providing good uniformity can do that. And we do that with area lighting with max to min ratio. So what are the factors that affect uniformity? So in this particular application, we've got a, 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 an ALED fixture from RAB, uh, two different versions, uh, a type four and a type two, which we'll cover later, later. But first of all is the optics. So optics meaning when the light comes out of the LED, that's primary and then secondary when it, it hits the lens, uh, how is that light, what, what happens to the light? Is it distributed evenly? Is it smooth? Is it focused in one angle? What is it? So that can definitely affect uniformity. Another thing is what type of light distribution is it? And we're going to cover that shortly. Then you also have to think about the location and the spacing of the poles. And last is the mounting height. Now, just a simple rule of thumb, I think everyone knows, but when you raise the mounting height, the uniformity improves. So the ratio gets smaller, okay? So as you lower the mounting height, okay, 
okay, then you're, you don't send as much light out as far, okay? So, so therefore, you have to watch out. The, the uh, uniformity could get worse, which means the ratio goes higher. All right, so that's just a little 101 on the uniformity. Let's look at our luminaire classifications from the IES. So these classifications are for both roadway and area lighting. And they're divided into what we call types, Roman numerals. So the type describes a fixture's light distribution. In other words, what is the type of pattern that the fixture distributes? So let's uh, unveil this from the IES. And there's a type one, two, three, four, five, and five S. And the S stands for square. So the one is very narrow. Two is it gets a little wider. Three is very common. A type three, over 50% of the area lighting that goes on poles that's sold and distributor stock is a type three because it can be used in roadways, it can be used in many parking areas. A four sends the light more forward, and a five is a circle. It's symmetrical. And then the 5S is a symmetrical square. Okay, so now that we've defined what those are, let's look at some applications. So the first one, we really don't have type one, very, very little, if any, in America. It's used over in Europe for the trolley car tracks, uh, but type two is the next one. And we use that typically for walking trails, bikeways, two lane roads, narrow applications where you want the lighting to go up and down and not as much across. We've already talked about the threes. Here is an ALED type three used in a shopping center. Could be for roads and many, many areas use this. Then a type four is usually used for perimeter locations or sometimes also inside pole locations like shopping centers. In this case, it's a little bit unusual. So you have, I have a narrow bikeway or walkway why am I using a type four? Why we used a type four was the area we're lighting is not only the where you're riding or walking, but it also opens the area up to make you feel more safe. So that's why we're a four work for this application. And then the five, again, a walkway. But what we're doing here, we're not just lighting the walkway, we're lighting the overall area to make everyone feel safe. So if someone is walking across the lawn or down the walkway, uh, the other person can identify them and see them coming. And it won't be going from light, in, uh, from dark into the light. So that's reason for the application. And then this last one here is the 5S. It's where you would have, uh, locate the pole in a center of a square shaped lighted area. So anywhere where that makes sense is where we would use that. So if you take a look at all these, we've we reviewed all these, there's a reason and a way to properly distribute the light using the different types of distributions. Now let's move to our next topic. It's been mentioned as lighting ordinances. So in a former life, I was the lead author of 25 municipal lighting ordinances. And I can tell you that everyone is different, and so no matter whether it's lenient, moderate, or strict, my goal was always to make sure that the lighting designer or the lighting practitioner could always do their job and do it well, even where you have strict ordinances. Take a look at this picture here. You'll see certain things that pop out as the way the lighting is being distributed. So first of all, there's no uplight. Second, you look directly at the fixture no glare, and you see the lighting coming out and lighting the area uh, around where the tasks are, the walkways and the, and the drive areas. All right, so let's get into this a little bit closer. What are the contents uh, of a typical lighting ordinance? So first of all, the maximum lighting level is usually specified for a certain type of areas. You may have also a limit on light pollution so that's lighting going up into the sky. Or you also typically will have light trespass 
especially where you have a commercial facility that borders a residential facility. So the maximum light trespass is often specified. So next, we do things and say things and write things in the ordinance to control the glare. Uh, and then CCT. So this is somewhat of a newer re restriction. Uh, and sometimes you don't see this in ordinances, but uh, warmer today by some people, especially that are concerned about the dark skies, is perceived to be better. So you may have a limitation on how, how high a CCT you can go. Uniform ratio, we, we just cover that to make sure that you have good visibility uh, to protect, provide safety and security. It's also provided. Ben mentioned something called a bug rating. We're gonna cover that shortly, but in today's uh, world, that could also be specified to indicate the limitation on certain types of fixtures and the distribution of those light fixtures. Then we have lighting zones. So you may have a downtown area or you may have a residential area. So there's five different zones that's defined in various documents by the IES. And so it, you may have a specification that this area is, is a, a certain zone. And then also there's something, you know what a curfew is, you gotta be in by a certain time. In this case, let's say 12 midnight, you may re be required to reduce your lighting by one half or maybe even cut the lighting off in that area unless it's required. So, and that's done with controls. So this is not a totally inclusive list, but all, many of these things are inside a, a typical lighting ordinance, but every one is customized and you really have to pay attention to what it is. So I have a question for all of you. So the Illuminating Engineering Society is the lighting authority. And then you also have the ordinance from a municipality, like for instance, this one from Raleigh. So which one has the final word? Well, actually, you may think it's the IES, but actually it's the ordinance. The ordinance, the local ordinance, always trumps everything. So it's very important when you're lighting something and you have and you know that there's a lighting ordinance that pertains to the job or project you're working on, very smart to get a copy of that ordinance, read it really well and find out the parameters that you must meet to get approval from the town planning board before you can actually get your final uh, sign off. Okay, now let's move to light levels. So this is one of the things in the ordinance. <clears throat> so it's not just enough to know the light levels, uh, we talked about the maximum amount of light allowed, but is it a minimum light level or is it average? And that's expressed in foot candles. Is it an initial foot candle level or is it maintained? So many times in an ordinance language, you will see minimum initial. Uh, they don't use averages and don't use maintained. A little different from some of the real world things, but this way they have more control uh, of, of things and there's no, there's less gray area. Okay, so next, light pollution. We mentioned light going up in the air. The correct terminology today is really not full cutoff because that's really a traditional lighting term, but the, the in lighting terminology in an ordinance, it's no light above 90 degrees. Because again, uh, that is relative photometry is, is the cutoff classification, but we still see both. Light trespass, going over unwanted light, going over to a neighbor's property. So you see one in the upper uh, where you have light going behind the pole spilling over into the property. In the bottom area, you see no light going behind the pole. So this is where the definition is for that. And then glare. How many of you have been in this situation? You may be walking across a parking area or you may be driving or something and you're blinded by the light coming into your eyes. A veil comes over your eyes and disables your vision. You can't see, your visibility decreases. And so 
we know this is really, you know, uh, we, we've got to be able to, as good lighting practitioners, uh, do the good job to prevent this. Now, an indicator of light distribution of outdoor fixtures uh, is provided by the fixture manufacturer, and RAB is, is your fixture manufacturer. And this is uh, developed by uh, the IES in conjunction with the IDA, uh, Dark Sky Association, and it's called BUG. And no, it's not the little things flying around. It stands for, first of all, backlight is B. So there's four ranges uh, or different angles low, medium, high, and very high. So the amount of backlight that's allowed are distributed out of that picture. Then the amount of uplight in two different zones, and then the glare rating. Now the glare rating is that very highest angle from 80 degrees to 90 degrees. It includes the forward light, and if you look over to the left, also the backlight. So that's where that glare rating is. So a typical rating, you may have a rating of uh, three, two, or maybe three, zero, two. So three is a range of, of lumens in a certain uh, angle. Uh, U is uplight, G is glare in that high angle. Now let's move to pole locations, which also is very important. So this is a beautiful photo, beautiful application. It's the Pearl River Hilton in Pearl River, New York. And uh, many of you may have stayed there as you visited training with RAB. Uh, so this uh, has uh, 5,000 Kelvin in the parking area and 3,000 actually on the facade. So a little bit of drama here in this application for a warm building, 3,000 K and then 5,000. Has a combination in the parking area of type threes and type twos. So let's. Uh, look at this a little closer and what we're seeing right here is poles that are inside the lighted area so it could be inside or it could be on the perimeter or it could be both so if you're inside a lighted area the possibility of a twos more than likely is going to be a three four five or a five s but if you're uh, on the perimeter you're not going to use a five or five s it's going to be a two three or four, some just some really good rules of thumb of design to utilize. All right, so now in a perimeter pole location, let's take a look and uh, analyze this. So first of all, uh, you have side distribution. So the, the fixture sends a long, narrow beam of light to the each side of the fixture. It also sends light forward, not a tremendous amount, but that's what you get from a type two situation. It would be perfect for lighting a perimeter like this. Uniformity here is really good because the, the pole spacing is, is, is well done. And also, look at that. There is no light going behind the pole. The cutoff is just perfect. No light trespassed over the property line. So, what if we were to change this from a type two? to a type three, what would we get? So we get more light behind the pole. Maybe the spacing of the poles are gonna be a little bit closer. Uh, and if you go to a type four here, then more lighting is gonna be going forward because the nickname for type four is forward throw. And then the distance also between the poles may be less. So last, what we wanna talk about is, are you gonna be using existing locations and equipment in the ground or are you going to be using using new is it a new pole is it a new foundation or can you use existing you have to consider a couple of things one is the epa wind loading you take a fixture down and you put another one up is it smaller is it about the same what is the wind loading of that particular fixture and also the weight of the fixtures so that does come into play are you using new pole locations, which would require new wiring, or are you using existing locations, but you still need to change the wiring because it's old and there's a problem? So all of these factors come into play in providing good area lighting.
So I'm going to turn this back over to Ben, and he's going to talk about the products that we use for the applications we've been talking about. Ben? All right. Thanks, Bob. A uh, lot of theory goes on with outdoor lighting, and the distribution is so unbelievably key uh, to put the light exactly where we want it to go. So with RAB area lights, we have four dif or three different families of area lights. We have our premium ALED, we have our standard, uh, which is our eye lot, and we have e our economy called lot blaster. To put things in perspective, typically what happens when we go from a premium to a standard and then we talk about our economy, the premium typically has more options available to you and the economy has fewer options. Here in the ALEDs, it's a little bit different. There's about 4,500 ALEDs options available out there. Uh, the uh, IVLOT in the center actually has something like 14,000 different uh, combinations, 14,000 different model numbers that you can choose from. And as we go through the presentation, uh, it'll become apparent why the IVLOT has a few more options or a few more NAID codes to choose from than uh, the premium ALED. And the economy lot blaster, there's like 1,400, 1,400 different economy um, versions of our area lights. So what are some of the similar features? Some of the similar features between these three families of products, the ALED is always gonna be on the left, the lot blaster is always gonna be on the right. A lot of times when we do presentations, we talk about one product, then we talk about the next product, then the next product. What I wanna do here is similar to what I did a couple of weeks ago when we talked about our uh, wall packs and floods um, to show them how, the, how these different product families stack up against each other. All of them are DLC. Some of them actually have DLC premium products. All of them have a 100,000 hour life. All are IP66 rated, meaning high pressure water can be squirted on these guys and everything would be fine. Zero to 10 volt dimming comes standard on all three families. You have 120 through 277 volt along with 480 volt versions and three, four and 5,000 K. Now, with the fact that all three of these guys have a 100,000 hour life, they do not have the same warranty. Most of the time when we talk about our economy family of products, which is this warranty that we see on the right, the five-year limited warranty, warranty, which does not include labor, a lot of our other economy fixtures have a shorter life, but the Lot Blaster actually happens to have the same exact life as the other two families of products, uh, where the Ive Lot and the Area Light uh, the ALED have that full warranty, no compromise, which includes labor. Another thing that differentiates these three different families is the number of wattages that are available. We can see over on the left, the ALED from 50 watts all the way up to a 360 watt version. Uh, lots of light outputs to choose from. The I've lot in the center actually has a little bit of a lower version there, the 38 watt, 4500 lumen, but we kind of have a, a, a low, a medium, and a high along with a lot blaster on the, on the right. We have a 7000 lumen, 12000 lumen, 17000 lumen, so your lower light output, your medium light output, and your higher light output. But again, the benefit that you get from the ALEDs is the ALEDs over there on the left give you those options, those two options, the 260 and the 360, which give you a tremendous amount of light to uh, shine out into your space. Now, Bob talked about distribution. All three families have type twos, type threes, and type fours. Now, when we get to uh, the Ive lot, the Ive lot actually has this uh, special version. It's actually technically really a type four distribution, but we call it an FT or forward throw. So it has this extra version of a forward throw uh, for the Ive lot. They all three have families, or sorry, have products that can do the either the type five, which is the round, or the type five S, which is the square. The Ive lot in the center and the lot blaster on the right, those package sizes that you see there on the screen, those are the package sizes that actually do the distribution completely around the light fixture. But when you do that, when you either have the round or the square distribution going around the, the, the light fixture, uh, with these two guys, you actually have the pole that's in the back. And so with this solution, you will get behind the pole a little bit of a shadow uh, where the light is being blocked by the pole that's uh, in the way. Now with the ALED family, we actually have a slightly different version for that guy. And if we can see this 
Type 5S that we have here. The Type 5S is specifically designed with a pole that goes right up through the center of the light fixture so that you get no shadows around the complete fixture. Great illumination for that Type 5S. So with the fact that the Ivelot has uh, five distributions to choose from. So here we have on the left, uh, the Ivelot, a type two distribution. The second one that we see there is the type three distribution. The third one is the type four, slightly higher wattage. We can see how the light is moving farther forward in the distribution patterns there. And then the last two that we have is that modified version of the forward throw, which actually has even less light along the back of the fixture with the light going forward. And then that type 5S illuminating completely around the, uh, the, the pole. So those are the five distributions, which is one of the reasons that makes the Ivelot have a whole lot more uh, NAID codes to choose from, uh, SKUs to choose from, because it has five distributions with those four wattages. Now, when we talk about finish color, the 260 and the 360 are available in bronze and white only. When we get to the 150 through 50 watt version, not only do you have the bronze and the white, you have black and gray uh, available to you. When we talk about the Ivelot, the Ivelot has standard um, bronze, white, black, gray in all options and all distributions, which again multiplies the number of options that you have because those four colors are standard in all wattages and all light outputs and all light distributions. Now, when we get to the Lot Blaster, the Lot Blaster is only available in two colors, uh, the bronze and the white, which again causes the skew count to decrease. Now, from a mounting standpoint, uh, you can uh, either have the universal pole adapter, which is actually in the next slide, but I just wanna talk about pole mounting first, and then I'll talk about the universal pole adapter. Uh, the universal pole adapter comes standard on the 50 through 150 watt A LEDs. Uh, for the Ivelot, the universal pole adapter comes on all of the units. It just it's part of the, the model number that you get. With the Ivelot, or sorry, with the lot blaster on the right, the universal pole adapter is optional. Now, the next way that you could potentially mount uh, these light fixtures, uh, the uh, you can take the a LED, like a 2T or a 3T, a 50 watt, and put that on the wall. It's actually not called an A LED. Uh, we actually called this originally a WP LED. So if you wanted to take um, an area light, a 2T 50 watt area light, and put it on the wall, you wouldn't order it as an A LED, you would order it as a WP. And those options are tr tremendous number of options for those guys so that you can have the same look of the light fixtures that go onto the building and have the same exact look of the fixtures that are on the pole. When we talk about the Ivelot, the Ivelot has right in the model number uh, whether you want it to be either pole mounted with the universal pole adapter or wall mounted. Uh, the Ivelot or the Lot Blaster on the right, you can't install that on the wall. There's no bracket or anything that we have in the system right now to install that on the wall. Uh, the last piece of the puzzle here happens to be that slip fitter that you see there. The ALED and the Ivelot can use a slip fitter. What's great about a slip fitter, typically when you're talking about parking lot lights and these types of area lights, uh, you're going to be installing these guys or sorry, parallel to the ground. Um, if, if you're on an uneven surface, you might need to adjust that so that it's flat, or you might want to take one of these area lights and angle it out a bit. Uh, to illuminate a larger area. And that's where you would use the slip fitter. Uh, so getting to the universal pole adapter, what's great about the universal pole adapter is it fits two inch all the way up to five inch hole patterns for both round and square poles. So here we have the way that the Ivelot, uh, it has its uh, universal pole adapter. So with this guy, we can see here the, the pole adapter, the little metal piece, it's specifically, and it's native, uh, when it comes right out of the box, the Ivelot is specifically designed to go onto round poles. Okay, we, we can see the little uh, uh, arch here. Now, with the uh, if you want to be able to make that guy a installed on a square pole, you would have to include this square pole adapter uh, that we see here uh, to be able to get it work to work properly. Now, some of the other uh, universal pole adapters are specifically designed, the piece of metal is specifically designed to go to flat 
poles or square poles, and then you have a little adapter that you put in for round poles. It just depends upon the version, um, whether that's the ALED, whether that's the IVLOT, or whether it's the LOT blaster. Each one has a slightly different way of how the universal pole adapter works, but all of them uh, can fit on round poles, square poles, two inches to five inches. And we've had a number of customers express to us uh, their, um, their thanks for uh, including the universal pole adapter where it would take a job like two or three days. They've been able to uh, take a two or three day job and uh, do it into a half day or maybe a full day. Uh, the universal pole adapter has uh, helped many contractors in uh, installing poles onto different, uh, installing different lights onto poles. Now, when we talk about lighting control, uh, we have our light cloud controller. The light cloud controller uh, can come factory installed on the A LED. It can come factory installed on the IVLOT. We see two slightly different versions of the light cloud controller on the left, uh, the older, uh, big, beefy um, light cloud controller. And then we have a smaller one uh, that can go on. It just depends upon the design of the fixture, how much room is inside the fixture on which one that you get. Lot Blaster, you cannot uh, order factory installed with a light cloud controller. I did uh, contact our light cloud team this morning. Um, before these guys were actually put into the system, we didn't have an occupancy sensor that was outdoor rated. We now currently have a light cloud sensor uh, that is IP66 rated and the IP66 rated um, occupancy sensor could potentially be installed um, in all three. Now, where it would be located would be in the same location that you would put for the uh, smart passive infrared occupancy sensor. So these guys are not networked. The ones on the bottom are non-networked occupancy sensors. <clears throat> uh, but these guys aren't dumb. Uh, they have about 11 different settings inside these occupancy sensors that are placed on each one of these products. So you can have non-networked smart uh, occupancy control or um, use the light cloud controller or do a special mods and customs to have the light cloud sensor installed on our area lights. Now getting towards the end of the different options that we have from a uh, area lighting standpoint, on the left we have our ALED that comes with the twist lock photocell right inside the box. With the um, IVLOT, uh, you actually need to order uh, the IVLOT that has uh, the receptacle on it and order the uh, photocell uh, separately, or you can get the lot blaster which has the um, photo cell inside the box. Now, taking a slightly different turn, uh, those are the main area lights that we have. Those are the ones that you think in terms of a parking lot light, um, maybe putting it on a wall uh, to have a similar look. You can likewise take those light fixtures that are normally on the wall or on a building, uh, like our, our WP LEDs and put them on a pole. Then they become an A LED. We actually have a family of these products why I like these products is we have a 50 watt version, 80 watt and a 104 by levels available for these guys, light cloud controller factory installed. You can get a photo cell on these, 122, 77, 480. Um, a lot of the same options, the same warranty that you have with your standard A LED uh, that we've seen with uh, the, the previous ones that I showed you. But what's great about these guys is these three little pictures on the bottom. So you can order it in three different ways. Zero degrees where that head is pointed directly to the ground with no light going up. You can actually get it with a seven and a half degree tilt and then a 15 degree tilt. So these are great for areas where you're storing stuff and you wanna be able to illuminate from the perimeter and not have any poles out in your storage area. Let's say you have a loading dock and in the loading dock, it's not very conducive for um, a truck driver to back directly in. They might have to make some uh, turns to be able to get into uh, the, the loading dock area. Having these area lights uh, that, that are really wall packs with these angled um, heads on them are a great way of taking 104 watts of LED light and really uh, pushing it out into that space so that you have a safe and secure environment for the loading docks or those area lights. 
So taking this, we do have a couple of other area lights uh, of a couple of lower wattages, uh, but I'm not gonna focus on those at the present moment. Uh, the next thing that I wanna focus on is our LED bollards. Our LED, LED bollards uh, follow a very similar pattern to our area lights. Uh, they're available in bronze and white. On the one on the right is the round with a flat top. The one in the middle is a round with a dome top. And the one on the right is a square. So a lot of these have the same features as the area light already has. What's different about these guys and getting back to distribution and um, the focus that I've had and what Bob has talked about in terms of having the light go exactly where you want it to go. For this one, we have a 24 watt version, 360 degrees. Uh, what it is, is we have a six watt LED in each one of the quadrants. So six times four is 24, so it's 24 watts. You have light that goes completely around the square or the round bollard. The next one we have is an 18 watt 270. And with that guy, you have an LED in three of the quadrants. Uh, the next option that's available is a, a 90 degree version, which is 12 watts, and has an LED in two adjacent quadrants. And the last one also is a 12 watt version, but it has the LEDs in opposite quadrants. So then you might say, okay, so the, the, this, there's all these different distributions, why? What does it matter? So here we have, um, I'm going to go to my spotlight. So hopefully you can see this. We have the walkway that's sitting right here. So just right south of where the bollards are, we have one, two, three, four bollards. And just right south of the bollards, we have the pathway. And looking at this 24 watt version with this 360 degree around the pole, the walkway is illuminated rather well and off the walkway is illuminated well. The next one that I have happens to be that 270 degree version. With this 270 degree, you have light that goes to the right, you have light that goes to the left, you have light that goes forward. Um, a lot of the light is arriving on the path. A little bit of light is going behind the bollard, um, illuminating that if you so choose. The last option happens to be the 12 watt 180 degree versions version. Now this goes into uh, the ambiance that I mentioned at the very beginning. Sometimes your goal isn't to have that top left one, which is nice even illumination. Um, when you have nice even illumination, you're going to be you're going to be able to see very well. You're going to be see, you're going to see very clearly, but it doesn't really add much drama, much uh, form to the space. Um, it can be bland. It can be very dull. Uh, but sometimes you want that when you're walking to and from, um, let's say, a school library. Uh, you don't want things or you don't need things to have much drama. Well, the one on the bottom right where we have light going to the right, light going to the left, a little bit on the pathway, a little bit off the pathway. You have these pools of light that create a, a different ambiance. And something like this would be used on maybe a path that winds through a garden or a park. Uh, that can create a, a very different feel. As long as uh, the design makes it so that you don't have roots to trip over or cracks uh, to, to, to cause problems, something like this can create a very different feel, a very different look um, as you walk through a space using the 12 watt 180 in the bottom right, opposed to the 24 watt 360 degree on the top left. And the last one that I have here happens to be the 12 watt 90 degree version. Uh, so for this one, we can see that this provides the most amount of light onto the pathway with the least amount of light behind the pathway. Um, nice solution for illuminating a path where you just want light on the path and you don't want light off of the path. Now, you can also use like the one on the top right, the 270 degree version. You can use that on um, a corner of where two walkways meet each other. Um, you could potentially even use some of the others in uh, areas where uh, you have T locations where you can do it on the inside or the outside corner. Um, so there's a, there's some nuances that you can use these. So when you make transitions or when paths make transitions, you can have a slightly different look um, depending upon uh, the distribution that you want and how you want the space lit. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Bob and he's going to bring us home.
Hey, Bob, you need you need to unmute yourself. There you go. You're good. Okay. So here we go. All right. So let's see if we can get the uh, the mouse to take hold again. So the first one here is learn the lighting metrics that affect our area and pathway lighting decisions. We talked a lot about that. Two is understand how a lighting ordinance can impact your RAB fixture selections and pole placements. And number three is design with the correct lighting from RAB that provides good visibility is the key to success. So this good visibility is really the key factor. And all of the things that we talked about together with the ordinance restrictions, if there are any, uh, being able to come into compliance and provide good visibility will be that key to the success. So we have uh, <clears throat> five uh, regional sales managers ready, that stand ready to help you uh, with all the information that we talked about with the selection of the proper area lighting and pathway lighting, talk about uh, the, the budgets, talk about the different uh, patterns, the designs and so forth, everything that we talked about today and more. Uh, so please reach out to us. If you have a project that you would like us to help you with, we stand ready to do that. Uh, and we're eager to do that. Uh, so with that, uh, we're going to say thank you for tuning in today. Uh, we really appreciate uh, your time. Uh, we hope you learned the takeaways and learned something for you. And we do have a few minutes now.